Hi everybody, my name's Jason DeWild and I'm the Head of Audio here at the Australian Institute of Music and welcome to part three on our series of Beginner's Guide for Pro Tools. In this part, we're going to be looking at the different types of tracks that you can get inside Pro Tools and how you can use them. Here we go. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of tracks that you're going to have in Pro Tools. Now, um, when you're sort of just starting in this Pro Tools um, environment, my recommendation is you stick to basically audio tracks, um, some instrument tracks, auxiliary tracks, and master faders. So they're the things I'm going to quickly explain to you about today. Um, the tracks that we've got at the moment, as you can see, um, these are what's called audio tracks. Okay, so obviously the ones you can see on screen at the moment are what's called audio tracks. And they're characterized by the fact that you can actually put what's called audio clips inside of these tracks. So these audio tracks can have as many clips as you want. You can copy them, you can paste them, you can move them around to wherever you need to be. You can cut them up, etc., etc., etc. So um, you can have um, audio tracks that contain audio clips inside them. So that's a very obvious one that we've got here. Um, flipping to the mix window, you can actually see what an audio track is even by just looking at the mix window. At the bottom right hand side of each channel, you'll see this little uh, wave icon here. So you can see that we've got a whole bunch of audio tracks here inside this particular session. Okay. All right, now, um, these audio tracks contain, um, contain a mono audio file. There's just simply a single audio file in here. But what I'm gonna do now is create a different type of audio track. So I'm gonna to go to the track menu and choose new. And here you can choose create a mono audio track, but for now, by way of example, I'm going to choose a stereo audio track, okay? I'm just gonna pop that in here, okay. Now, stereo audio tracks kind of look the same um, as a mono audio one, but um, to show you the difference, I'm gonna take this left overhead track and I'm going to take this right overhead track and I'm going to, since they are sort of a left and a right, I'm going to actually going to move those into my stereo audio track like so. Okay, so you can see straight away the difference on a stereo audio track. A mono audio track will only contain a single audio file inside of it. Um, or a single audio waveform, a stereo one is going to contain two separate waveforms. So the, I'm going to call this stereo overheads. Right. And, it's ca and this is um, very, very handy to have. So I've just basically taken these two mono audio tracks and made it into a stereo audio track. This has a, a, an advantage. Um, Firstly, if I flip over to the mix window, and remember the shortcut is command equals to flip over there, you can see that here is my uh, stereo overheads. Now, if I wanted to turn up the overheads in my previous example, I would have actually had to turn up one fader and then another fader by the same amount, okay? And sometimes that can be, well, it's just an extra click to, to kind of actually do it that way. When you have a stereo audio track, you're treating the left and the right as a sort of equal thing. So basically having that control over two audio files in one audio track is very, very handy to have. And of course you can mute, you can solo, you can record arm a stereo audio track as well. You'll also notice that the stereo audio track actually has two pan pots. Okay, so this allows you to actually um, uh, change the stereo positioning of the left hand file as well as the right hand file. Now by default, it pans one to the left and one to the right, but there are occasions when we're mixing where we might not actually want that. But so this a stereo track gives us the, the ability to pan each audio file. And it's kind of similar to how we have this here. We've got uh, one fader, one pan, another fader, another pan. All we're doing here is now having one fader and the two pan controls are still here. Same deal. All right. 
The other thing about a stereo audio track is that when we're inserting and, and applying effects and, uh, and things like that, it does it across both uh, channels of the stereo audio track. Um, again, it's, you know, if I was to apply an EQ onto this one and then I was to um, and change, you know, some, some of the things about this, and if I wanted to then do that same onto this one, I'd actually have to copy it across. And then if I if I wanted to make change, it would just be a, a kind of a pain here. So it's far easier to just do it in this way, where you where your one audio track uh, contains one plugin, and this is going to change the left and right channels at, at the same time. Okay, so that is um, the difference between a stereo and a mono audio track. So I hope that's clear. Okay, so another type of audio track that you're going to get in Pro Tools is something called an auxiliary input track. Okay, now um, I've set created an auxiliary input track. This is one. This is the one that I'm referring to here at the moment. And on the mixer window, it looks exactly like an audio track. Um, it's got a fader, it's got a couple of pan controls, so this is a stereo auxiliary input track. Um, the only difference when looking actually at um, this uh, at the window is that the audio track will have this kind of icon, whereas auxiliary input track is an arrow, downward arrow type icon. So what is the auxiliary input track used for? Well, what happens is that you can't actually put, whereas an audio track allows you to put audio clips on it, an auxiliary input track doesn't allow you to put clips on it. See, I'm trying to drag this audio track audio clip down to the auxiliary input track it's not working so what do we use this for well think of the auxiliary input track is basically like being a pipeline to allow other audio signals to go through so in this example what i've actually done is i've actually made all of these drum tracks all of those ones through here channel through this auxiliary input track so you can see that i've set the um, the output of this particular track, right, to something called the drum submix. Okay, so basically all of these audio tracks are going to the drum submix track, right, the mix output. This in turn, these outputs, right, are then being picked up by the input of the auxiliary input track. Right, so effectively now this has got an input of auxiliary of drum submix. So all of these drum channels are being fed into this auxiliary input channel. And what this allows me to do is basically have control over the entire drum kit in one go. So let me show you how that works. I'll just play a little bit of the track. I'll just go back and find a section. Okay, so. Most of the time I got on this earth and spend it with you. So. I can actually change the whole level of the drum kit because all of these all of these channels are being fed to this channel, right? This is like the pipeline. So this allows me to control the entire drum uh, mix, right, with one fader. So if I wanted to turn up the kit, I could either turn up all of these or just the one fader as I've got it here. So this is obviously. The one you're with, hold on to the ride and let it bring you bliss. Okay, so it's obviously a much more um, useful way. Of, um, of being able to control large numbers of channels. And a lot of engineers will do it this, use these auxiliary input tracks in this regard by making other ch uh, audio tracks feed through. It also means that if I wanted to compress or do any EQ, I could actually do it across the entire group um, or individually if I wanted to. So if I'd wanted some overall processing on the drum kit, um, it would be better to just put one compressor or one EQ across the auxiliary input track. So a very, very useful way of doing this. Another reason, another way you use auxiliary input tracks 
is as effects send and returns. Okay, so um, we're going to get into a little bit more about this in mixing. But if you look over at this particular channel, I've got a reverb um, track here. This is again an auxiliary input track. And it has a reverb plugged into it. So all we're doing at this point is we're using the auxiliary input track here as what's called a send and return. So it is allowing um, any of these channels to be sent to the reverb, right, which will feed into this track, be processed by that sound and come out the other side. Now we're going to get a lot more into um, send and returns a little bit later on, but that's just to highlight another use for an auxiliary input track. Okay. The next track that we're going to have a look at is the organ track here. If you have a look at this, this is a different type of um, track again. And this is called a MIDI track, uh, or actually in strict sense, this is actually called an instrument track. An instrument track has this type of icon, and if you flip over to the edit window, okay, you can see that the um, instrument track holds different type of information. This information here is audio, this information here is MIDI information. So an instrument track holds MIDI information. And in this case, it's holding notes. These notes are then fed into this instrument. So when we play our track, it's the MIDI notes that are feeding the actual instrument um, itself. So we're going to just maybe play a little bit through... this section here, let's just play that. All right, so what's actually happening in this regard is that the, um, the MIDI data is being sent to the instrument and the instrument is then creating the sound and then feeding it to the output to join the rest of the mix. Okay, so here's the output, which is just joining everything else that, else in our mix. So an instrument track holds MIDI information and not audio information. There is one other type um, of track um, that's a little similar to this. Um, and if you look under track, just create new, you can see that we've got an instrument tracks. So we've already talked about that. And you've also got a MIDI track. Okay, now MIDI track, um, I won't get into a huge amount, but just suffice to say that it is a little different from an instrument track. Um, and the main difference is that, okay, firstly, the similarities, you can actually um, put MIDI information on to a MIDI track, as you would expect. But where the difference is, is that this MIDI information doesn't go to an instrument that's on the track itself. So here is the MIDI track that I've created, and there's no way to put an instrument actually onto a MIDI track. So what you actually, um, so here is the instrument track, which has the instrument on it. A MIDI track does not contain an instrument, and so therefore this MIDI data needs to go to different places. And that's why, the sort of the really the main difference is that the MIDI information on an instrument track goes to the instrument. The MIDI information on a MIDI track goes to a different place, which can be an instrument on another track. But um, for now, um, when you're getting into Pro Tools, the best thing to do is actually just create an instrument track and put the instrument on the same track. A final track um, type that I want to walk you through is this one here, which is called the Master Fader. Again, um, if you go into Track, New, you can create a Master Fader, either Mono or Stereo, and you end up with a, a fader that looks like that. I always create these when I'm uh, using Pro Tools, mainly because this allows me to monitor what's coming out of the final outputs of my, um, of my session. So it's really important to keep an eye on the meters of this track because you can very easily overload um, a Pro Tools session, especially when you've got this many tracks. Um, if you continue to turn up 24 of these tracks, you're going to inevitably have the master clipping at some point. So let's have a little look at this. 
And I might be got a hiss in the truck. Our time is right now, baby. I can't wait. Still our time waiting for the world to spell it out. We're gonna yell it out. So you can see that um, my uh, my particular session is running quite well under its peak here, so that's not too bad. Alright. It's better to run a little bit low, but in order to kind of keep things nice and clean, an ideal level would be sort of similar around that's at this minus six mark, okay? Um, there are various reasons for that, but I, I've certainly experimented quite a lot and had, you know, sessions running up at this kind of level or even down at this level. And I've kind of found that, you know, it's sort of the best compromise and really the best quality is kind of sitting around at this sort of minus six or even a bit lower. Um, I just think it just provides a much kind of cleaner and nicer signal. And the master fader helps you just monitor to how you're running things at that time. So we've done a quick overview on the different types of tracks and a little bit about session management. Um, I want to just finish off um, a little thing about the importance of um, of naming things. Okay, you'll see along my uh, particular session that I've named the tracks of how I wanted to. And um, certainly when you create a new track, you come up with a sort of a default. So if I create a mono audio track, it comes up with audio one. All right, so it's always a good idea to, um, to get in the habit of as soon as you create the track, Step one is to actually name it. So we you know, might call this, you know, voice BB or whatever we want to call it. So just so that we've always get an understanding of um, the um, of what what our tracks are actually doing. Okay, to delete a track, it's quite easy. You just simply highlight it. This is called selecting it. So when you make it white like that, highlight it. You right click and you can choose delete a track. Okay, so I'm going to delete this MIDI track here as well. So I just right click and delete. Okay, um, so that's one thing to name your tracks. The other thing that's really useful is to actually get these colors happening. You'll notice that um, um, I've really been sticking to colors here. You notice that when I created my stereo uh, overheads track, it turned black. So I'm going to make this the same color as my drums. So the way I you you can do this, get access to the to the different colors, is by clicking this little bar underneath. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to highlight the um, this track, um, and in fact I'm going to highlight all of the drum tracks. And I'm holding. Sorry, I should explain this. If you click one track and then you shift select another track, it selects everything else in between. So that's very very useful to have. Now I'm just going to double click on this bar here and this brings up the color chart and I'm just going to click on a, a color to bring that or the whole channel up to that. And what I normally do is I'm actually going to include the drum submix into that thing as well. So I'm going to have my drums basically all in a row like this with the drum submix as the last channel for it. And so that's a very useful thing to um, to you know get into the habit of just coloring your tracks. So here's the backing vocals. Kind of double click onto that, and um, let's make that uh, this kind of blue. That's fine. And here's some um, sort of uh, here's a, my organ track. So I'm going to make that orange, for example. And uh, here's my effects and sort of other bits and pieces. So I'm going to make that. In, maybe this purple okay so it's um, very useful so you've got some kind of indication it's easy to see where your tracks are um, where your groups tracks are grouped to I hope that was useful for you um, don't forget if you've got any questions just leave a comment on the video and we'll see you next time so I hope you enjoyed that micro lecture on track types within Pro Tools Stay tuned, there's plenty more to come in this series and don't forget to check out the other AIM TV videos. Till next time, see you later.